Well, hello and welcome to the Between Movements podcast. This is episode 21, and today we are going over part two of Rachmaninoff's 10 Aspects of Beautiful Pianoforte Playing. And this was an article he wrote back in 1910 that was published in the Etude magazine. In the last episode, I covered numbers one through five, so today I will be finishing out numbers six through 10. Now, before I get started with today's topic, I just want to remind you all that you can find me on YouTube at josh.v.music, where I post my performances, practice vlogs, as well as educational content. I'm also across social media at josh.v.music, and you can also find me on Patreon if you want to support my work where you get bonus content. And as a big update, I finished the first movement of Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto, the single piano arrangement that I'm doing. So if you want to find that PDF, as well as a lot of content pertaining to that, you can find that on my Patreon at Josh V Music. Now, number six of Rachmaninoff's 10 important aspects of playing the piano is the significance of the pedal. He says, the pedal has been called the soul of the piano. I never realized what this meant until I heard Anton Rubinstein, whose playing seemed so marvelous to me that it beggars description. His mastery of the pedal was nothing short of phenomenal. In the last movement of the B-flat minor sonata of Chopin, he produced pedal effects that can never be described, but for anyone who remembers them, they will always be treasured as one of the greatest musical joys. Alexander Skriabin, by the way, agreed with Rachmaninoff when it came to the significance of pedaling, and he would show all of his students that pedal was just as important as the fingers. He would also teach his students to play with all three pedals, sometimes all three at the same time. Oftentimes this is really neglected in piano lessons. It gets sort of brushed over as something that you should be expected to know how to do, but there's really a lot of nuance in the pedal. I would highly encourage everyone to check out Tone Based Piano, and they have a podcast on pedaling as well as a recent YouTube video. Just a lot of great pianists talking about their thoughts on the pedal and the nuances thereof. Continuing on with Rachmaninoff's article, he says, The pedal is the study of a lifetime. It is the most difficult branch of higher pianoforte study. Of course, one may make rules for its use, and the student should carefully study all these rules, but at the same time, these rules may often be skillfully broken in order to produce some very charming effects. There's sort of a joke in music where we say, you need to know the rules in order to break the rules. Because if you're just doing the wrong thing, but you don't know that you're doing the wrong thing, wrong, quote unquote, then you're just not really aware of the musical language. But if you know what's happening and you purposefully take a deviation from what is expected, then it's more of an artistic choice rather than just sort of a blunder. Rachmaninoff says, the rules represent a few known principles that are within the grasp of our musical intelligence. They may be compared with the planet upon which we live and about which we know so much. Beyond the rules, however, is the great universe, the celestial system which only the telescopic artistic sight of the great musician can penetrate. This Rubinstein and some others have done, bringing to our mundane vision undreamt of beauties which they alone could perceive. So a lot of poetic language there at the end, which is essentially really talking about the musical imagination and the colors and ideas that can be brought about with pedaling. Without the pedal, we really don't have the modern instrument. It's so important, it's, it can't really be overstated because without the pedal, you can't hold down notes on one end of the piano and have them ring and be at the other end of the piano. Everything is far less legato, far less connected. So the pedal gives the illusion, at least I'm talking about the right pedal, the damper pedal, gives the illusion of you having more than two hands. Now, the left pedal is more of a coloristic thing where you push it down. Uh, It's called the unicorda pedal because it actually on a grand piano will shift the keyboard very slightly. And by shifting the keyboard over a little bit, the hammer is not encountering all three strings. It's only supposed to encounter one of the strings. So it's not just for volume. It's also for coloristic effect because you don't have as much resonance. And the sostenuto pedal, or the middle pedal, is the one that's probably the least understood. But it's one that I like to use a lot in certain instances because it can really give a very cool effect of holding down only part of the notes and not holding down other notes that you play. Now coming in at number seven, 
Rachmaninoff says, the danger of convention. While we must respect the traditions of the past, which for the most part are very intangible to us because they are only to be found in books, we must nevertheless not be bound down by convention. Iconoclasm is the law of artistic progress. So I, I've talked about this before in other episodes and in some of my vlogs where when it comes to the traditions of the past, we can only really guess because it was before the advent of recording technology. So you can read about it, uh, what people said, what theorists said, letters, reviews, but it's very hard to truly know what the great performers and composers of the past sounded like because we're only really guessing. Rachmaninoff says iconoclasm is the law of artistic progress or trying things in a new way or unexpected way. He says all great composers and performers have built upon the ruins of conventions that they themselves have destroyed. It is infinitely better to create than to imitate. Before we can create, however, it is well to make ourselves familiar with the best that has preceded us. This applies not only to composition, but to piano forte playing as well. And I would add to this, especially in today's age, with all the recordings available to us, that it's very, very important that today's musicians are constantly listening to the great performers of the past and the present. The master pianists Rubinstein and Liszt were both marvelously broad in the scope of their knowledge. They knew the literature of the pianoforte in all its possible branches. They made themselves familiar with every possible phase of musical advancement. This is the reason for their gigantic musical prominence. Their greatness was not the hollow shell of acquired technique. They knew, and he says they knew in capital letters. Oh, for more students in these days with their genuine thirst for real musical knowledge, and not merely with a desire to make a superficial exhibition at the keyboard. Now, this is something that you always hear great performers and composers talking about. They're trying to get at something that is deeper than just the surface level, deeper than just the technique, and goes beyond just the superficial ability to play very fast or very clean. But there's something beyond that in a musical understanding. Part of this is the what he calls, I think, the danger of convention or just trying to copy people that came before you. There's something, like he says, beyond that hollow shell. It's just an inner knowledge. So... I think this can only come about with years and years of, of not just practice, but familiarizing yourself with the knowledge of the music and having it become something that is truly individual. Now for number eight, Rachmaninoff says, real musical understanding. I am told that some teachers lay a great deal of stress upon the necessity for the people learning the source of the composer's inspiration. This is interesting, of course, and may help to stimulate a dull imagination. However, I am convinced that it would be far better for the student to depend more upon his real musical understanding. It is a mistake to suppose that the knowledge of the fact that Schubert was inspired by a certain poem, or that Chopin was inspired by a certain legend, could ever make up for the lack of the real essentials leading to good pianoforte playing. The student must see, first of all, the main points of musical relationship in a composition. He must understand what it is that gives the work unity. You know, I've heard it said that music is the most abstract of all the art forms because uh, it happens in the moment. It's, it's not something tangible that you can take hold of like an actual piece of artwork or maybe even dance might be more tangible because it is it is the physical act that is the art form whereas the physical act of music making is the means to achieve the art form so the way that we get around that abstract idea as musicians is we we understand the language within the music itself you could say that words or language is abstract in the same way to someone who doesn't speak the language they're just random series of sounds. And so the real musical understanding comes with not just understanding what, what it means, but I think fluency. I can understand a decent amount of French conversationally, but I am not very fluent in it right now because I haven't used it for so long. 
in the same way to have real musical understanding you have to be involved in it constantly be playing it be listening to it uh, hopefully playing with other musicians as well to give you really true musical understanding Rachmaninoff says he must understand what it is that gives the work unity, cohesion, force, or grace, and must know how to bring out these elements. There's a tendency with some teachers to magnify the importance of auxiliary studies and minimize the importance of essentials. This course is wrong and must lead to erroneous results. I don't think Rachmaninoff is saying it's unimportant to know the inspiration behind pieces, but he was really reiterating some of his earlier points about the conception of the piece, the technical proficiency, really these fundamentals. He keeps going back to the idea of fundamentals. Because really knowing that a piece was inspired by a poem or by nature, it can give you some nice mental imagery, but he is right in saying that it won't make you play the piece better. Uh, you have to have the fundamentals, and then I think you can build upon that by knowing the circumstances of the piece. Number nine is one that actually really surprised me, uh, but I'm, I'm glad to see that Rachmaninoff puts this in his top ten. He says, playing to educate the public. The virtuoso must have some far greater motive than that of playing for gain. He has a mission, and that mission is to educate the public. It is quite as necessary for the sincere student in the home to carry on this educational work. For this reason, it is to his advantage to direct his efforts towards pieces which he feels will be of musical educational advantage to his friends. In this, he must use judgment and not overstep their intelligence too far. With the virtuoso, it is somewhat different. He expects and even demands from his audience a certain grade of musical taste, a certain degree of musical education. Otherwise, he would work in vain. If the public would enjoy the greatest in music, they must hear good music until these beauties become evident. I think what he's talking about here is really playing in a way that connects to the audience and that they are able to relate to and yet also pushes the boundaries. From the text, it doesn't seem as though he's particularly saying that uh, someone who is playing a piece or a performer needs to explain the music verbally to the audience, although that is something that I like to do before I perform. When I give concerts, I always like to talk even a little bit to the audience because I find that even giving a one, two minute little introduction verbally to the piece helps people engage a lot more. If they simply know what to listen for, uh, maybe a piece is based off a certain motif, maybe kind of going back to the last point about the composer situation of the piece, for the, for the audience I feel this is also important because they can have that framework for their imagination and take it where it will. Now Tonebase has decided to omit the second half of what Rachmaninoff says in Playing to Educate the Public because he echoes some of the common sentiment of his day, which is uh, really somewhat derogatory towards certain people groups. I won't get into it. Uh, essentially, he's trying to say that you need to play for the right audience because some people cannot understand it. Uh, if you want to read this part, you can definitely go to the Etude magazine. It's up there. But I want to take this idea in a, in a different direction. What I think is probably more accurate to say is that um, I, as I've spoken in the past, I don't like this notion that music is a universal language. It's a common thing that people say, oh yeah, music, the universal language. It's really not, because the more that you study music and music cultures, the more you realize that what is considered aesthetically pleasing in one culture might not be in another culture, and the very fundamentals of music itself are completely different. Tonal systems, the way they tune, understandings of rhythm, instrumentation, the way they use the voice, all of these things. So West African drumming is very different than uh, music that one might hear in a Javanese gamelan orchestra. It's different than traditional Chinese music. It's different than, of course, Western classical. So if you were to play a classical piano concerts for uh, any part of the world that was not exposed to classical music at all, yeah, of, of course, they probably wouldn't understand it. It would be very different than their tradition. Uh, it doesn't make it any more or less valid. 
I just think it's completely different. In fact, I heard this story in university and I'm, I've been trying to find the source of it because it tells the story of someone who brought a, a member of a gamelan orchestra, Indonesian music, to their very first attendance of a Western orchestra. Uh, I don't remember the piece that they played. It was some famous symphony and, and the person very excitedly turned to this member of the gamelan orchestra and said, wow, what, do you th what was your favorite part of this concert experience? And uh, to his dismay, the gamelan player said, oh, the part in the beginning when all the instrumentalists walked on stage and tuned their instruments. So really, he liked the tuning more than the music itself, probably because it was so different than gamelan music to, to what he understood. So maybe perhaps taking it even a step further than Rachmaninoff, I would, I would say the educating the public, to me at least, is very important. Of course, that's why I do all these podcasts. That's why I do these YouTube videos, because uh, I, I value my role as a teacher, and I think that it enhances my role as a performer as well. Now, lastly, number 10, this one is mysteriously missing from the Etude magazine, but it is in the tone base PDF, which is available online in the description. Number 10 is the vital spark. Rachmaninoff says, in all good pianoforte playing, there is a vital spark that seems to make each interpretation of a masterpiece into a living thing. It exists only for the moment and cannot be explained. For instance, two pianists of equal technical ability may play the same composition. With one, the playing is dull, lifeless, and sapless. With the other, there is something that is indescribably wonderful. His playing seems fairly to quiver with life. It commands interest and inspires the audience. When the composition was originally written, the composer was unquestionably inspired. When the performer finds the same joy that the composer found at the moment the composition came into existence, then something new and different enters his plane. Now, I've heard it said by teachers that the act of performing classical music is a little bit like a conversation between the performer and the composer. Rachmaninoff says it seems to be stimulated and invigorated in a manner altogether marvelous. The audiences realize this instantly and will even sometimes forgive technical imperfections if the performance is inspired. Now, this I found to be true from personal experience, both with myself on the stage and as an audience member. This is really a subject of hot debate among performers and musicians, and it has been probably uh, ever since the advent of professional music. This is something that is very hard to explain. It's something at a soul level and something that makes us uniquely human. I am of the belief too in this sort of vital spark. It's at such a deep soul level and sometimes maybe even a subconscious level. It is hard to explain this vital spark, but we all know it, we all feel it when there's a performance that everyone seems to connect to. Rachmaninoff goes on to say, Rubinstein was technically marvelous, and yet he admitted making mistakes. Now, this is Anton Rubinstein, not Arthur, that he's talking about. Nevertheless, for every possible mistake he may have made, he gave in return ideas and musical tone pictures that would have made up for a million mistakes. When Rubinstein was over-exact, his plane lost something of its wonderful charm. I remember that upon occasion he was playing Balakirev's Islamé at a concert. Something distracted his attention and he apparently forgot the composition entirely, but he kept on improvising in the style of the piece, and after about four minutes the remainder of the composition came back to him and he played it to the end correctly. There's a friend of mine who's a very good artist and he just had this simple quote that stuck with me when I was talking about... Uh, working on music and making mistakes and he said beauty is not perfect and i think that that's just something we struggle with because we want to play all the right notes at the right tempo in the right rhythms but uh, there is something of that imperfection that maintains a human quality and when we try to be so perfect we become almost machine-like now it is interesting, Rachmaninoff continues in this story about Anton Rubinstein, he says, This annoyed him greatly, and he played the next number upon the program with the greatest exactness, but strange to say, lost the wonderful charm of the interpretation of the piece in which his memory had failed him. 
By the way, this gets into the topic again of improvisation and how important it is for performers of today to be able to improvise. I've done this a few times in my own concerts. Uh, it's a very good skill to have because if you get lost, you can just make up things along the way. And those who don't really know the piece won't even know sometimes if you're able to play it off well. Rachmaninoff says, Rubinstein was really incomparable, even more so because he was full of human impulse and his playing very far removed from mechanical perfection. While, of course, the student must play the notes and all of the notes in the manner and in the time in which the composer intended that they should be played, his efforts should by no means stop with notes. Every individual note in a composition is important, but there is something quite as important as the notes, and that is the soul. After all, the vital spark is the soul, and I think that's the crux of the matter when it comes to this tenth point. The soul is the source of that higher expression in music which cannot be represented in dynamic marks. The soul feels the need for crescendos and diminuendos intuitively. The mere matter of the duration of a pause upon a note depends upon its significance, and the soul of the artist dictates to him just how long such a pause should be held. If the student resorts to mechanical rules and depends upon them absolutely, his playing will be soulless. Fine playing requires much deep thought away from the keyboard. The student should not feel that when the notes have been played, his task is done. It is, in fact, only begun. He must make the piece a part of himself. Every note must awaken in him a kind of musical consciousness of his real artistic mission. Now, it's interesting to me that he spends probably the most amount of time talking about this vital spark when you compare it to numbers 1 through 10. It really is uh, quite a bit longer in terms of the how much he wrote concerning the vital spark. And at the same time, it's the most ambiguous, the most difficult to really capture because uh, we are talking about the matters of the soul. We're talking about things that are truly subjective at the end of the day. And yet, I think we would all agree that as musicians, it's also one of the most important things, because why else are we doing this unless we're trying to establish a connection with the audience, or the listener, or even ourselves? If, if we're playing something and it moves us, what is it that moves us? What is it that moves others? And that is, I think, for me, something I'm always trying to drive at. Of course, get the technique, get the technical as close to quote unquote perfect as possible, but more importantly, get at the essence of the piece. So that concludes Rachmaninoff's article, The 10 Aspects of Beautiful Piano Forte Playing. I hope that you found it interesting as well as informative. I certainly enjoyed covering this topic. So with that, thank you guys for all the support. I love you all, and I will see you on the next episode.